saved it was a new one that he put in there and i'm glad we have it and that uh, we can and it's, it's here's what's amazing the bible says that many will see it how do you see a song not sing a song but see a song you know it comes out in your life doesn't it and people will see it i'm glad you're here tonight it's good to see you let's go ahead and pray let's ask god to help us as we come into our service and in his presence tonight let's pray heavenly father i pray you'd help us tonight lord uh, all the Things of the week have piled up on people. And Lord, I pray that, as someone said years ago, I heard them say that good godly music will blow the dust off of a dry soul. I pray that we would have that tonight. I pray that our prayer time would be powerful. I pray that the preaching of your word would bring encouragement and lift up our spirits and give us what we need. Lord, I pray that you would help us to glorify you Lord, whatever the need is in each person's heart tonight, we'll trust you to meet that. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would use whatever it takes in our service to encourage, to change, to challenge, to uh, do the work that needs to be done in our hearts. And we will thank you for all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. And okay, we stand one more time, facing 402. Is it the love of Jesus? Something wonderful. Too. Let me remind you about Sunday. Dr. Jack Lawson will be here preaching Sunday morning and Sunday night, and I hope you'll be in your place. Don't miss it. 
Uh, if you want to hear a good preacher for a change, come Sunday, all right? And uh, he is wonderful. Pastor, and I think, Brother Rachel, you have to help me, was it 47 years? I think it was 47 years he pastored different churches in this area and uh, taught at Gwinnett Hall when Brother Rex was there uh, for 27 years at the Bible College. He's going to be helping us with the Gwinnett School of the Bible teaching, and uh, I know it's going to be a great blessing to you. So make sure you're here in your place Sunday be pray for that, all right? Let's pray with the offering. Brother Malin, if you don't mind, would you ask God to bless, please? Dear Lord, I thank you for an opportunity to come back to serve you tonight. I, I do pray, Father, that you'd bless us each and every one here tonight. Uh, open up your word to us. And help us, Lord, not, not, to, not to forget it, but Lord, help us, Lord, to uh, take it out to other people in the world. And Lord, we just ask that you bless this offering, use it for honor and your glory. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> start off with a prayer request. Uh, we pray for the missionaries and our service is Sunday at life. So let's turn it around and pray for our missionaries, all of our missionaries that we support and others that, that we do not own abroad. We pray especially pray for uh, the service Sunday, Brother Lawson comes. In fact, not only uh, did Brother Lawson uh, teach uh, in the college at Gwinnett Hall, but he was the dean there for many, many years. Very, very intelligent man, and he had the touch of God most. Yes. And so I uh, just want to throw that in. So, but Brother Bill, would you pray for the missionaries in the uh, service this Sunday? Would you do that? Father, we do thank you for the missionaries uh, that's out of the and out of our church, uh, the GPA missionaries, and the other missionaries that we support, Lord. Uh, we will take the rest of the service tonight and mention all of them by name. And we know the need of each and every one of them. So we, Father, we pray that you meet that need. One on the farm field, I pray that you would touch them and encourage them. I pray that you would let them see souls saved. Lord, uh, I pray for the uh, upcoming uh, GPA camp meeting we're going to be having in a couple of months. I pray that you bless it and uh, just, uh, just give us a good meeting. Father, I do pray for our church service Sunday. I pray that you would uh, be with Brother Jack as he brings the message. I pray that you would give us hearts. To hear what you have us to hear, not only hear it, Lord, but change our lives so that we might live for you, see people saved. I pray that you bless uh, the singers of the same Sunday morning, bless the singers who leads us. Lord, we just pray that you give us a good day. Um, bless our pastor, bless Brother Josh and his family. I pray that you will this weekend with GPA Capital, and I pray that you do with him and with them. We will meet you next week. And bless this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So what else got a special prayer request you need to mention at this time? Anybody a special prayer request? Yes, ma'am. So pray for my dad, Larry Sims. It looks like he possibly had a stroke over the weekend. He needs to have a, he had a CT scan and there was, it, it was really, it showed a lot of things going on that don't look good. So they wanted to have an MRI and he's kind of resisting it. I don't know if it's just because he scared him. I don't know. Uh, but we're praying we're going to have an MRI so we can see what's going on. And he's just right, he's feeling better, but he's very dizzy and um, lightheaded. And, but he had a lot of symptoms of a stroke. So you would pray for him. His name's Larry. Brother Mailer, would you pray for that request? Then, Lord, I thank you for it. We can, we can run out of questions here. And I do pray for all that you do with uh, Larry and take care of him. I pray for all of Maybe, maybe he didn't have a stroke. I pray for him when he just uh, has uh, high blood pressure or low blood pressure or something like that. Uh, uh, Lord, I just, I just pray for him that uh, you'll take care of the situation and that uh, you'll uh, help him when he go get that in on line and find out what exactly is going on so that, so that everybody can have be addressed and peace with it. Lord. And, and I just pray for him that you'll, you'll follow him 
to be a part of it. It's just thinking, you know, to get on with it and let them know to move on and just like God would be keeping you changing and growing and just get up there and in and up there and there to encourage you and uh, lift you up and let you know that, uh, that they'll be that with you and that they'll go through it with you and just so they'll give you support in any, any way that they can. And then we just ask all things in your precious and holy son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Someone else got a special prayer request for me to make mention of tonight. Anybody? Yes, sir. Um, continue to pray for a music director. Okay. I tell you what, why don't you pray for that right now? Would you do that? Yes, sir. Dear Lord, I thank you for letting us be able to pray together and pray for each other, Lord. I pray that our youth group will get a youth director, Lord, as we love from the Lord and our mom teaching, but as we, as we might go on youth activities and stuff, it would be very helpful to have a youth director there. I pray that you would give that to us and provide it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Someone else got a special prayer request. Can you preach 45 minutes, preacher? No. no well, I can't. Can. Of course, I can't. <laughs> <Everyone knows that. laughs> we don't have another private way to go preach higher than high. Right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> no, I've got, we need to be praying for Miss Jewel Hill. The passing of her husband, Alex, last week, and then also pray for Miss Dubby of her son passing um, Friday evening, I believe it was. He passed, so Miss Dubby and Miss Jewel, we're going to pray for Miss Dubby and Miss Jewel, pray, pray for them. Brother, uh, go ahead and pray. Charlie, would you pray for that request? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we did lift up Jewel Hill and Dubby to you. We know that uh, in mourning because of the passing of a relative, we ask that uh, you give them peace and understanding that you know that they, even though they're gone from here, they're, they're with Jesus now. And we'll, you will help be able to see them whenever they get there. So we just ask for, for peace and contentment and uh, just whatever else they need. We ask it all in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. 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 Anybody else got a special prayer request? Anybody? Yes, ma'am. Uh, pray for uh, uh, Charity Burrow. Uh, she's uh, she's having a difficult time. Uh, I don't know exactly. I, I talked to her husband yesterday, uh, and uh, he said that she's she's down and out, and uh, she she's not doing too good. She lives in in uh, Marietta, and uh, so I I don't. She's more of my, my wife is people than, than me. I, I, don't, I don't know, but uh, I, I know her, but I don't, uh, I don't, we don't need to see her too much. Yeah. What's her name again? Uh, Cindy uh, Burrow. Cindy Burrow, okay. Uh, Ms. Abby, would you pray for that request? Mm -hmm. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to be together on the long road in our lives. How about a praise? Somebody got a praise. God done something special for you. Yes, ma'am. Well, Friday, uh, we took Jason back to Emory for more testing. And it's a And she said, I'm going to pray with you. And she prayed with me, and I hung up the phone. 
and I went over and I got my Bible and I just started reading. And God gave me such a peace. I can't explain what he did for me, what he did to my heart, how I, all of a sudden, I knew he was in control. I knew he had everything in his hands. And Jason called me that night and he said, Mom, We've been through a lot lately, and I want you to know that God hasn't given up on me, and I'm not giving up on him. And it was like, it was just what I needed to hear at that moment. And I just can't stop praising God since then. Amen. 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 He is truly wonderful. Amen. Somebody else got to pray. Anybody else got to Yes, ma'am. I want to praise the Lord. In fact, I want to give her credit for my daughter. She got a great report when she went back to the doctor. So I, I'm very, I just want to give him all the honor and praise. Amen. 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 Wonderful. Wonderful. Anybody else got to pray? Yes, sir. Just by the way, you when you go to the GPA, can't leave me in the air. Amen. 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 Friday morning at 4 a.m. Remember that and that crowd will get there. I hope they have a, a good trip, good and safe and blessed trip. Anybody else got a pray? Let me mention this also. Uh, Brother Lawson was teaching at uh, Gwinnett Hall. Me and my wife both took all of his theology classes. And uh, she paid him to make better grades than I did. <laughs> so don't, don't mention that to somebody mentioned that to him suddenly, but you knew that for me. <laughs> I think Brother Rex, you ought to just say that from the pulpit to everybody when he's here. <laughs> he would appreciate it, but knowing him is I don't know him as well as everybody else does sometimes, but I spent some time with him and he's pretty sharp. And uh, you say something like that, I don't I, I might be a little nervous about what he might say back after you turn the pulpit over to him. So uh, that's good. I spoke with Brother Lawson on um, Monday, I think it was, and just talking with him, and he was so excited about teaching in the School of the Bible this fall. Um, when I saw when I saw him a couple weeks ago, uh, he was literally in tears because he was so excited that he gets to do this. I'm sitting in his living room, gave him the curriculum, we looked through a little bit. And I said, I want to thank you for being able to do this. It means a lot to me. And he started just silently, tears started coming down his face. And he said, I want to say thank you for letting me do it. I thought I was done. I said, if I'm around, you're not done. <laughs> no, sir. And uh, he's so excited about it. But um, anyway, good, good, good. Acts chapter 20 tonight. Acts chapter 20. Well, I can take a hint. You were short on prayer requests and praises tonight. Um, so I know what you're trying to say. Let's get out early, right? <laughs> no promises. <laughs> I walked over here, my wife was, I was coming over here, my wife was going in for discipleship, and I looked back and I said, be done early, I'm not preaching long. And she said, yeah, right. <laughs> and I said, no, I normally have five or six pages of notes, and now I have two and a half. She said, you'll extend it, it'll be fine. <laughs> She knows me, but uh, we'll see what more does with it. I, I, you know, some some sermons that I I I am so guilty. I'm more guilty of this than probably anybody I know. I was listening to somebody a, a, a podcast on preaching and homiletics and this kind of thing just yesterday, and this man who's been preaching for about sixty something years, he said, he said one of the biggest things I've been guilty of is preaching head bowed down sermons. What is a head bowed down sermon? That's what I was thinking. He said, well, if you're wondering what a head bowed down sermon is, it's, it's we start out like this. Let's take our Bibles and turn to such and such passage. In the world, terrible. Everything's just falling apart. And he said, we're getting ready to open up the word of God and we just bring everybody down so they just bow their heads. That's a head bowed down sermon. Well, I'm guilty of that so often. Hopefully tonight's not going to be that way. But I'm going to start out trying to get you thinking a little bit. So uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 20. We're going to read uh, 9, 10 verses tonight. Let me ask you, have you ever been so upset that you just can't sleep at night? Have you ever been that way before? you ever just, just so upset you can't sleep at night? Yeah. What about you ever 
That is a big one. You've been so upset you've lost your appetite. Ever done that? Yeah. <laughs> Some people are like, can't sleep, can't eat. No, I can eat. Yeah, I've, I've been at the place before where I can't sleep. I have no desire to eat. I've been there. What upsets you? What is it? What are some things that upset you to the point that calls you to live a miserable, frustrated life? Think about it. What can a person do that would bother you so much that you become consumed with that thought so much that it actually alters the way you live? Your schedule, your habits, your thoughts. What would be some of those things? Well, I'm going to show you in Acts chapter 20. Paul had a he had a certain mindset that we need to adopt. And I want to show you. Now, I'm going to just tell you this. If you're not reading in the King James Bible, uh, the verse I'm going to preach from tonight may not be in your Bible. But NIV has removed this verse. And so if you're not reading from the King James, you're going to totally miss what I'm going to preach to you tonight. But uh, I want to just point something out to you as we read. Verse 17. The Bible says, And from my leaders, he sent to Ephesus. This is Paul sending instructions and uh, a charge, so to speak, to the pastors in Ephesus. And he called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came to Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with, tear, with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the, uh, by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God, and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, saying that, that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Here's Paul. The Bible says, and this is these are his words, Paul's testimony in this. He says in verse 22, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem. The fact of the matter is the Holy Spirit may have bound him and his spirit may have been bound up, but the fact is he's under arrest and he is literally bound. And he's going to Jerusalem to stand before magistrates and rulers and political leaders and uh, emperors and, and kings. And they're going to determine what's going to happen with Paul. He didn't know what was going to happen to him. But he did say in verse 25, he said, I have gone preaching the kingdom of God. Or excuse me, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. In other words, he knew that it may not turn out the way he would want it to. This could be the end of his life. He had gone on missionary journeys. He had started churches. He had led people to Christ. He had established pastors. He had established Christians. He had done a wonderful work. And he didn't know what was in store, but he had determined in verse 24, after all these things, he said, I'm probably going to die. I'm bound up. I'm going to Jerusalem. I don't know what's going to happen. I've, I, verse 19, I've served the Lord with humility of mind, with many tears and temptations, uh, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. He says, verse 20, I, now uh, how I kept nothing back that was profitable to you. He said, I think about things that are profitable to you. 
He said, I've given myself completely. I have held nothing back. Can you imagine giving yourself to God and to others so that you can say with a clear conscience and the Holy Spirit approving it enough to put in the Bible, I held nothing back. If you needed encouragement, I gave you encouragement. If, I, if you needed rebuke, I gave you rebuke. If you needed teaching, I taught you. If you needed whatever it was that I could give you, I gave you everything. Think how draining that would be. The stress that that would cause. The hardships that that would be. He said in verse 20, I have taught you publicly from house to house. He said, I've gone to the Jews, I've gone to the Greeks, and now I go back to Jerusalem, I'm bound in the Spirit. Verse 24, but none of these things move me. None of these things move me. Those things didn't cause him to leave where God wanted him to be. They didn't cause him to stop doing what God told him to do. He didn't forsake the calling and the command that God had put on his life. So I'm going to ask you tonight, what things would move you? What things would move you? What do we allow to move us that we should not allow to move us? I want you to mark, if you would, in verse 24, the word thing. But none of these things move me. The word things there, and I normally don't go into this because it really, I don't want it to sound like it shouldn't, but the, the word there for things is the word in Greek, logos. Now, many of you may know what that means already, but it's important to know that that word things is literally the word logos. It means this, something that is said, words that would proceed from somebody's mouth. It also has the idea of something that would be thought about you. None of these things that have been said about me, these thoughts that people think about me, the reputation that they think I may have, the things that they've done to me, none of these things move me. I want you to get this down if you would. There's something that shouldn't move you, and that's communication. Communications from other people should not move you. Please understand this very well tonight. Gossip and slander only hurt. Nothing good comes from gossip and slander. And Paul knew what it meant to have those kinds of things, those words said about him. I mean, even it, it talks about how that people would lie in wait, those temptations that befell him. People would lie in wait. They would gossip and stir people up and they go over here and slander him and stir people up until there's a mob and run him out of town. It happened all the time. Everywhere he went, that's what happened. He said, but those communications, those things will not move me. Can I tell you this, that evil intentions and thoughts and words from other people should not move you. They shouldn't move you. Words that work against you and words that work against what God's given you to do and God's work in your life should not cause you to be moved from what God wants you to do. I want to encourage you tonight to live for God and serve the Lord out of a pure heart, regardless of what people may say. You've heard the saying, you can please some people some of the time. But you're not going to please all the people all the time, right? You're not going to. You may have heard the story about the, the older gentleman who was a father, and he had a little boy who was his son, and they were going in town. It was a long, long time ago, and they had a donkey. You may have heard this story. The dad, the little boy, and the donkey were going into town. Well, they were going into town, and the dad was on the donkey. And a little boy was walking beside and they were going into town and all they get, they get towards the city and, and people started talking. I said, look at that man. Making that little boy with those little short legs have to walk beside him while he sits on that donkey all comfortable. 
I can't believe it. And so the dad heard what they were saying. He thought, well, that is kind of bad. So he got off the donkey, put his son on the donkey, and they started walking. And the next group of people said, look at that. Look at that little boy sitting on that donkey. He's so young and so full of energy, making his old dad walk next to that donkey. I can't believe he's making him do that. So the dad heard it and thought, wow. So he took his son off the donkey, and they just walked, both of them. Nobody on the donkey. Next group of people saw it. Here's the dad and the, and the little boy. They're walking, just walking beside the donkey. And they said, they've got a donkey, and they're not even using it. I can't believe it. So the dad heard it and thought, well, I don't want people to think I'm, you know, doing that. So he got on the donkey, and his son got on the donkey at the same time. They're going through the town, and the people came by, and they started talking and whispering and gossiping and slandering. He said, look at that poor donkey having to carry both those people. I and mean, we can go on with that story for a long time, but you get the point. You're not going to please everybody because everybody's got an opinion. And most of them stink. They do. Everybody's got an opinion about how you should live your life and what you should do. Uh, look, I've been saying this, and I hope you'll get this. If you live your life to please one person, and that's not your spouse or your parents or your pastor or your kids or your grandkids or your boss or a co-worker, if you live to please the Lord Jesus Christ, you will live with a lot less stress. It's liberating. I used to be so concerned about what people would think. I was, here's what I learned. When, you try, when you're so concerned about what people are saying and thinking, you get paranoid. You do, you get paranoid. You know, paranoia, paranoid is a fear that's not real, but it's real to you and nobody else. I was paranoid. It would get to the point, I mean, I had some issues going on and people gossiping and cut us down, all that stuff. And, God was blessing the church, but some people didn't like it. And I was so, I was young. I was so concerned about it. I walked into a restaurant one time. It was just, I mean, when I say a restaurant, it was in a barn. Okay, literally in a barn. And it was called uh, Kenna's Cooking Kettle was the name of it. Kenna, she ran it. And she's the only person that worked there. Kenna's Cooking Kettle. Only thing she had good that was pie, was pie there. People in the church nicknamed it Kenna's Choking Pew. Because that's about what it was about, all right? But uh, we go into Kenna's, and I'd sit there, and somebody would be whispering when I walked in, and I immediately thought they were talking about me. And I didn't know who they were. Because I was paranoid, because I was wondering about what everybody was saying and thinking, but it was a liberating day when I realized I can live for Jesus, and I can live for Him. And if I live for them, they're going to talk. If I live for him, they're going to talk. I may as well live for him. Amen. That was a liberating day. Now, don't get me wrong. You're going to think that I don't care what people think. I do care what people think. You know why? I want people to like me. Because I'm somewhat normal. Normal people want other people to like them. I mean, if you find somebody that says, I don't care what anybody thinks, they can do whatever they want. Either they're lying or they're weird probably lying because we all have that built in that idea we want friends and people to like us all that's normal but when you can live for Jesus alone what a what a liberating truth don't don't let these things these communications what people say the way they talk don't let it get to you don't let it don't let it bother you so much that's literally in this context that is exactly what Paul is saying none of these things, these things, the things are the words that people say about it. They're not going to move me. I'm just going to keep on going for the Lord. Your life will be so much more simple, less frustrating, less stressful. If you don't live for people, if you'll just live for the Lord, it'll help you. I heard of a, uh, a Religious institution, church. Not too awful far from here. Uh, if I told you, you would probably have no idea about the church. I'd never heard of it, but I went online, looked it up and everything. I heard about a church that has Baptist on its name. About an hour, a little more than an hour from here, other side of Atlanta. I heard about them. And I heard about some of the things that they're doing with 
not just music, but the people who sing in the music and some of the staff and people that get paid and that kind of thing in church. I heard some of the, about the lifestyle that they're living. I say lifestyle, I don't mean they were just gossipers. I'm talking about they were full out committing abominations against God according to what the Bible says in Romans 1. I, they, and the people knew about it. You go on. I heard about that. Oh, my goodness. I heard of, I think it was last night or night before. I, I, yeah, I think it was two nights ago. I don't know if you've ever heard of the evangelist, Dr. Tom Farrell. Anybody heard of Tom Farrell? He passed away just a couple of days ago. Powerful preacher. Oh, my goodness. Powerful preacher. I'm thinking about the, I talked with him one time, probably 12, 13 years ago. And I said, you travel up, what's the thing that you see the most that really bothers you? And he said, churches that used to be good. Not big, not full, but solid, good churches that are not that way now. He said, I've been around long enough where I could, I preach in churches. And then several years later, I go back and it's the kind of church I can never go back to because of their doctrine and their, just the way they are. I started thinking about that when I saw that he passed away. It came to my mind. So I wrote this down. None of these things move me. I'm not going to let compromise move me. Compromisers. People are going to change what they believe. Change their stance on not politics, but the word of God. I'm not going to let that move me. And you shouldn't either. Amen. Don't let it move you. Uh, it, it's hard. It's hard. I don't know if. Well, I don't even go into it. We go into it. It's hard when people that you love change. And I don't mean change. I don't mean change preferential things. I'm talking about they change doctrine. They change things that really are solid, primary, fundamental issues, and it, they change it. And they know better. And you know they know better. And the word of God's against it. But they change. They compromise. And I hate to even use the word compromise. I think a better word would be they become disobedient to God. Compromise is a man's word. Disobedience is God's word. We soften it with compromise. Literally, it's disobedience to God and his word. But that shouldn't change you. It shouldn't move you. I, I was thinking about this. I know a lot of churches who have tried to reach the world and as they have been over to reach the world, they've fallen into it. Christians who say, you know what, I need to try to help this person and they bend over to help them up and they get pulled into that mess rather than pulling somebody out of it. Is it heartbreaking? Oh, it it hurts. But none of these things move me. Don't let it get you out of the game. Don't let, you, don't let it get you out of the battle. Don't let it get you out of where God placed you to be. No doubt Paul knew what that was like. I mean, he, he allowed John Mark to go on a missionary journey. We don't know why he quit. But he was young. Maybe he got homesick, maybe he missed mom, maybe he missed home cooking, maybe he couldn't handle the hardship, but he left Paul and went back home. I can imagine three times there's a man's name mentioned in the Bible, Demas. Demas started out as just someone who was with Paul. The second time you find him, he was a co-laborer with Paul. He was serving alongside Paul. And then the third time, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. But that shouldn't move you. Paul didn't get off the ship and say, fine, if he can't do it, I'm done. He kept on going. He went on another missionary journey, he started another church, and he led another person to Christ. Don't let other people's disobedience determine your disobedience and your obedience. You keep on going for the Lord. None of these things move me. 
The Bible does say that evil men and seducers wax worse and worse, and I don't know how it falls on the page of your Bible, but on mine, it's the top, on the right page, top left-hand column, it says on the right-hand side of the page, it says, but uh, evil men and seducers wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, and, and gives the list. The next column, same page, the next words, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and here's the key, and has been assured of. Amen. We need some Christians who don't just learn. Watch. I, I, I don't watch. Don't just learn. Watch. Well, I signed up for the Gwinnett School of the Bible. I'm going to learn. Timothy had learned some things, but what kept him faithful was the things he had been assured of. We need some Christians who are assured of some things. That'll keep you going. Paul told Timothy, he said, Oh, Timothy, keep that which has been committed to thy trust. Don't let other people's disobedience cause you to lose your obedience to Christ. And then the last one, he didn't let communication stop him from moving. He didn't let compromising and compromisers stop him. He also didn't let other Christians stop him. You think about Paul and all that he went through in his life. Was Demas saved or not saved? Let me answer it this way with another question. Can a Christian be faithful and then become unfaithful? Sure they can. Sure. I've always said a Christian can do anything a lost person does, just not for his law. Either they're going to get their conviction get right or God's going to take them home. If those things don't happen, they probably weren't saved. Hebrews 12, look it up. Look. Demas forsook him. John Mark left for a little while, but then he said, now he's profitable to the ministry. Bring him to me. I could use him. But in that time, I imagine it was a hard time. I mean, all these things that took place, Paul did not let other Christians Moving. I've said this before and I hope it didn't rub you the wrong way but let me say it again I believe with all my heart that Christians do more damage and hurt to gospel ministry and the cause of Christ than lost people do I'm going to say this it's Wednesday night if you hear it again in a few weeks bear with me on a Sunday probably a Sunday night I think Lord will let me. It's a seed thought that I just I just cannot get rid of in my heart. You remember First uh, Timothy, chapter one. I'm forgetting the verse now. It's early on, early on. Paul said talked about uh, Timothy's mother and grandmother and the faith that they had. He said, "I know it's in you too." And he talked about not just faith. He said the unfeigned faith. That means something that's not fake. It's real. I was studying that out and God convicted me and spoke to me about something. I've been dealing with truth for a few weeks on Sunday night. Just speak the truth in love and tell the truth and tell the truth. Here's what I've learned. This is just a seed thought. I'm still letting it marinate in my heart and mind. People don't care about truth. They should, but they don't. People, especially young people, especially young people, those who are about 35 and younger, 40 and younger. Yes, they care about truth, but that's not number one. They want to know what's real. Now let that sink in. Mom and dad can say, I believe the truth, but did it change them? If truth didn't change them, then it wasn't real to them. People come into our church and say, well, they, they say they preach the truth, but if they, they're not going to stick around long enough to see if it's true or not, if it's not real to us. Is it real to you? What's real? That's what people want to know. See, other Christians may know the truth, but if they don't let the Lord do a work in their heart, was it real to them? That's hard. That's deeper. 
And I'll be honest, that cuts and hurts at a deeper level than these other things. I expect a lost world that is unregenerate. They don't know the Lord Jesus as their Savior. They are lost in their sin. Their eyes are blinded. I expect them to act like that. I mean, you can't expect anything else. They don't know the Lord. They don't know the Holy Spirit living in them. I, I, I kind of expect churches, pastors, and some other people maybe to lead their families and lead their churches a totally different direction than they should because I believe there's, there's a great falling away, apostasy, and that's this time. And I also believe a lot of those same people never had a genuine walk with the Lord. I'm not saying they're not saved. I just believe they, uh, that's a debate we'll go into some other time. But I, I, I believe that at the very least, they weren't walking with the Lord. They weren't walking with the Lord. So I kind of expect it. But it hurts at a completely different level when it's a fellow Christian, a brother or sister in Christ. You love you've prayed for, that you've worked with, you've discipled, you've taught, you've, you've prayed with, you, you've, you, you, you've had fellowship together, and, and there's just, it's a different thing. And I come to realize I don't have to do what other people do. And I don't have to let that get me discouraged. Oh, it'll get me down for a little while, but it doesn't have to get me off track. It doesn't have to move me. And it doesn't have to move you. Look up here. It doesn't have to move you. It may hurt, but it doesn't have to move you. It doesn't have to get you away from where God wants you to be. Here's what I'm, I'm so thankful for. You read Romans 14. I love that chapter. It's, I've learned so much. Every person here tonight has individual liberty that God has given them. They say it's a Baptist distinctive. B A P T I S T S. It's I is individual soul liberty. We believe it, but it's one of the least practiced doctrines in our churches today. Is individual liberty. Watch. What that means is this: you get to decide how you're going to live your life. That doctrine of Romans 14 is what our free our freedom in this country came from was that fundamental doctrine was individual liberty. That's where it came from. That's why, we're, that's why we have freedom in this country because we believe in individual liberty. It also means this. You can go to God yourself and say, Lord, I'm going to seek you and I need you to guide me personally on decisions and my life and how I should live and how I should live for you. That is your freedom to do that. And God can speak to you and show you how to do that. You say, you mean I can do whatever I want? But there's a thing, yes. You, you, yes, you can. But responsibility comes with that too. You are responsible for what you do and what you say. You say, you mean I can do whatever I want? Sure. But don't think you get to choose the consequences for what you do. You're going to lose relationships. You can lose your health. You may lose your life. You can lose a job. You can lose a whole lot. Because that's why the thief came to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Can Jesus restore? Absolutely, he can. But you're going to have scars. You'll have marks that you'll never be able to remove. Memories, baggage that you carry with you the rest of your life. Does it hurt seeing that? Sure it does. I don't know. This may have been more of a message for those who maybe have been around for a little while, been around the block a few times, been down the road a few miles. You've been safe for a while. You've, you, you've come to a certain level in your Christian life. Watch. A new Christian, been safe for a short time. It doesn't hurt them as much because they're the one being taught. They're the one being helped. They're the one being discipled. But those of us who are trying to help other people, Sometimes I'd rather somebody take a dull knife and cut my chest open and tear my heart out than some of the heartaches of other Christians.
but it shouldn't move you. None of these things move me. Neither count I, Paul said this, neither count I my life, my life dear to myself. He had a high view of God and a high view of what God gave him to do. So I want to finish my ministry and my course with joy. Curtis Hudson said years ago, I know that I'm on a journey and I know I'm going to enjoy the destination, heaven. And this is what some of us need to get. Those who tend to suck on lemons every morning and drink pickle juice for lunch and, and prunes for supper and just walk around with you know, your face drawn down and just, I mean, just all upset like a, an old bulldog or something. Watch your face, you know? He said, I know I'm going to enjoy the journey. Or excuse me, I know I'm going to enjoy the destination, but my goal is to enjoy the journey. Enjoy the journey. It's hard sometimes, but none of these things move me. What's it going to take to move you? What's it going to take? The Bible says in Galatians 6, 9, and let us not be weary in well-doing. So I don't know if I'm doing that well. No, no, no. In well-doing. If you're doing good, don't be weary in it. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. I'm going to close it with this. Flip over a few pages to 1 Corinthians 15, if you would, please. You know this verse. I know it's not new to you, but I'm going to show you something that maybe you haven't seen. Maybe you have. I, I forget sometimes. We have some real Bible scholars in our church, and I don't say that tongue-in-cheek or sarcastic, but we have some people in this church that know the Bible far better than I ever will. I understand that. So maybe you have seen this before. You know the chapter, right? The resurrection of Jesus Christ, the foundation of our faith, and so on, okay? If, if Christ isn't risen, then we're the most miserable people, our faith is in vain, and, and, and so on. But Christ is risen. Then you go down to the last verse, chapter, chapter 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. It's not worthless. It's not wasted. It's not empty. If you're doing it in the Lord, it is not vain. So how can I be steadfast? How can I be unmovable? How can I be, how can I say, but none of these things move me. How could I do that? Did you notice the first word of that verse? I know we, we get so corny and cheesy with this. When you see the word therefore, see what it's there for. That's actually a really good thing, but we say it so often, it's like, oh, okay. Well, you got to look at it because it connects those words that we just read. I mean, steadfast, I move always about the word of the Lord to what was just said in verse 57. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. How do you do it? You realize it's not you. God gives you the victory. Our victory comes from God through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how you do it. See, but you don't understand what I'm going through at home or with my, in my own mind and in in, in what, what I've done or what people are saying. God gives you the victory. None of these things move me. Why? Because God can help me. Because I walk with the Lord Jesus every day. He lives in my heart through the Holy Spirit. He gives me victory. Victory in Jesus is not just a song. It's a real thing. And you can have it. He's given it to you. We think, oh, I live, I, I got a battle today. I got a fight today. And all these things that are just loved down on me. It's just so hard. I'm fighting and battling. And I finally win. Oh, I'm victorious. You wake up the next day. Oh, it's a battle again. I'm fighting it. I'm, I feel like I'm losing. And maybe sometimes you do lose. And you give it to temptation. And you, whatever it is, and you, you take another step. But it's in defeat that time. 
You know, that's not the way the Bible says Christians live. The Bible teaches us that Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, we have the victory, and we are more than conquerors. We're more. It'd be great to be a conqueror, but, Jesus, but the Bible says we're more than conquerors. And it says this, we live from victory unto victory. It's not battle to battle to victory to battle to defeat. It's victory to victory because God's already won it for you. We lose when we're not walking with him. That's when we lose. None of these things move me. I could go on. I, I would look, I want you to have your head lift up when you walk out of here. I don't want you walking out discouraged and sad and ashamed. I want you walking out knowing that God can lift you up and God can encourage you. You don't have to be like driven by the wind. You can people may say things, you may see things you don't like. People that you love dearly may disappoint you, but none of these things move me. I keep on going. You need to also. It's a great journey. It's a great journey. I want every single one of you on the journey with me. Heavenly Father, would you help us today? Oh, Father, my, my heart goes out to people. I know there are struggles. I know there's hardships and difficulties. I know that there's guilt and shame. I know that there's questions and doubting. Lord, the only thing that I know to offer people sometimes is Jesus. So, Lord, tonight I give our people Jesus. He is our victory. He is our hope. He is our prize. He's our reward. He's the author and finisher of our faith. Lord, would you please help me? Help me that I'll continue on. Help us be faithful to you. Before I finish my prayer and I and we close it out. How many people say tonight, Pastor, God has dealt with me. I, he's, he's, he's either convicted or he's encouraged, but he has spoken to me. I've heard his voice tonight. Would you be able to lift your hand in the air? Let me pray for you. You know specifically. Amen. Lord, you've seen the hands tonight. Lord, I think I could guess at most of what people are would raise their hand about, but I know that each person that's here and maybe didn't raise their hand, maybe they did, there's something that I don't know about that nobody knows about except you and them. That maybe would sidetrack them. As Paul said, that he would become a shipwreck himself and a castaway. Lord, I pray for those who have heard your voice tonight. Please continue working in their heart and life. As you speak, may they surrender and obey you completely. I pray you would comfort them, help them to keep on keeping on, not get sidetracked, but to still follow you completely with their lives. Now, Lord, I love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your wonderful, great love for us. May we walk in that love the rest of this week in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming out tonight. Be in your place Sunday. Pray for us as we go. I'm speaking. I'll be I'm preaching Tuesday morning up in Portage. And we got 2,000 miles of traveling. So pray for our safety. All right. God bless you. Thank you.